happy to welcome you here today. I'm Kathy Kesselman, um, President of Blue Knot, and I'm together with me today I have Pam Stavropoulos, who's our Head of Research. Hi, Pam, if you'd like to just introduce yourself briefly. Yeah, sure, Kathy. Hello, everybody. My name's Pam Stavropoulos. I'm Head of Research with Blue Knot, have been for several years now, um, and I also have a clinical practice, small clinical practice of complex trauma clients. Thanks, Pam, and great to have you today. Um, obviously, we've collaborated over many years. I think it's close to a decade. Um, I was thinking that coming up. Yeah. To <laughs> um, and, 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 and published, you know, a number of documents, a number of sets of guidelines, and, uh, you know, it's quite an array now, and I thought it'd be really great to meet today to just talk about, you know, the various guidelines, how, how they came about, and what their different roles are. Sure. Um, so and going we, going back perhaps to the first set in 2012, if you'd like to just paint a picture of them. Sure. And we were just saying before we hit record that the word guidelines is singular and we can all fall into the trap of thinking it's just one set, but Blue Knot now has a number of guidelines. That's very timely to clarify. Even for ourselves when there's so much work with all the different sets. So it goes back to 2012, as, as you said, Kathy, um, which in some ways is a long time ago and in other ways not. But at that time, or prior to 2012, there actually weren't guidelines for complex trauma, which seems really strange now um, because the American um, colleagues were very close to getting out their set, which are now there. But we actually got ours out um, first, which is quite interesting. And um, despite the fact a lot of the work obviously is from American clinicians and researchers, the, contribution of the guidelines that was recognised is that it brings together so many different approaches, you know, the neuroscience, the attachment, the clinical side, trauma-informed. So um, those guidelines came out in 2012 and they were sent across to the ISSTD, which is the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation, which is the sort of peak body for trauma and dissociation based in the US. Um, and they got picked up very quickly and unanimously endorsed and were invited to present them at the ISSDD conference of 2012. And they were launched in parliament by the then Federal Minister for Mental Health, wasn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, so really took off. And following that, um, just shortly after the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses for Child Sexual Abuse was announced. So it was a sort of convergence of circumstances that led to Blue Knot really starting to be known for the work that we've done um, and when it was called ASCA, Adult Surviving Child Abuse, prior to 2012. So 2012 was really a milestone year for complex trauma, for Blue Knot. Um, but time goes on, as Cathy said, you know, several years later, a couple of years ago, um, maybe we should update them and thought, well, I guess we should because a lot has happened in the intervening time from 2012 to yeah. 2019, which was when the clinical guidelines came out at the end mm. of last year. Mm. So, so, I suppose, so I suppose going back to those 2012 guidelines, if you'd just like to talk a little, because there were two sets of guidelines in those and maybe yes. just to, yes. to talk to both sets and then we'll get to the sort of the up, more updated sure. guidelines soon. Yep. Sure. Yeah. So at the time, um, it's made sense to have the two sets in the one publication. So we had the clinical set, that was the first set of guidelines in the 2012 publication. Um, so very much for clinicians, for therapists, for mental health workers who um, you know, work directly in a clinical therapeutic sense with people who experience the impacts of complex trauma. So they're what we call the clinical guidelines. It's good to explain this because there is a bit of confusion sometimes. But we also um, released in the same publication in 2012 a second set of guidelines on organisational, and we called those the trauma-informed organisational guidelines because trauma-informed actually relates more specifically to organisations um, rather than to clinical one-to-one -one work. That's what's a little bit confusing for people. And also because they were both released in the same publication, the clinical and the organisational in 2012, um, the organisational ones were a bit overshadowed. The clinical ones got picked up very quickly um, and trauma-informed is, is developed too, but because it's a slightly different emphasis um, and because there's just so much material now available in both clinical and non-clinical, mm. we decided for the update in 2019 to release them as two separate publications, the updated ones. So the clinical ones have come out last year. The organisational ones will come out under separate cover pretty soon. We're just finalising those. But mm. that's the big 
point of clarification for people like this, that clinical is about clinical treatment. Um, Trauma-informed is really non-clinical. It's, it's organisational. It's about how to treat people in a humane way so that all workers who work in mental health and other settings know how not to make things worse. It's not about being a clinician to be trauma mm. And, and, and really trauma-informed applies to us all. So beyond organisations, it's Absolutely. really a, a way for human beings to, to treat one another regardless of roles and yeah, where, where they are. Absolutely. And that's the key point because we now know, of course, and the Royal Commission's very much established it, that trauma is so prevalent throughout society. So it's really important that people don't feel they can't say anything about trauma or can't you know, speak to somebody who's experienced trauma. Think, I'm not a clinician. I don't know what to say. Of course, the clinical work is specialised. Of course, that's dealt with by clinicians. But chances are, given the prevalence of trauma that we all know, if we haven't experienced ourselves, someone in the family or a friend or someone. So we need to know broadly what the impacts of trauma are, how it affects people and how to speak to people in a basic sense. You know, if they've experienced trauma, which also leads to another point, Kathy. Of course, we've released separate publications on how to talk about trauma. So yes. there's a lot to fill everybody in. But um, <laughs> talking about trauma is another series. They're not really guidelines, but they're papers we've also released that are very important for the general public. We've got one paper on it. We've got one on mental health professionals. Um, we've got I think one due for GPs. Yeah, one so, the primary yes. care. Yes. I suppose I don't want people to think it's just for clinicians. Trauma is a very mm. broad issue. Yeah. So let's just talk briefly about the Talking About Trauma series. How important is it to talk about trauma? Oh, look, I think it's incredibly important. And I think everybody realises this now. Where the confusion is, is how do you do it? I think maybe prior to perhaps as recently as the Royal Commission, people thought, oh, maybe trauma and it's terrible. Maybe it's just a few people. Now we know it is incredibly prevalent that it takes many different forms. So it's very important it's talked about. And I think people do know that, but how to do it in a sensitive way is the $60,000 question. Mm -hmm. We also know that even trained clinicians often don't screen for trauma. Um, so even when people are trained, it can be hard to know how do we actually raise this. But because it's so prevalent, we do need to know. And, it, and it's not as difficult. Um, it, I think the real thing is, as we're saying, the sort of phobia about how do I do it? But there are a few pointers and suggestions which we address in the paper about how to do it in a low key, non-stressful way for the person we're talking to and <clears throat> for ourselves as well. Because mm. I think there's a misconception that, you know, people need to explore all the, all the, the detail of what happened to them, all, mm. all the, the, the graphic information. And uh, yeah, mm. can you just sort of talk to that a little bit? Because I think obviously that can be quite re-traumatizing. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's the importance of, of knowing the basics because it's not at all about going into detail. And it's really sad if something as simple as saying, look, I'm really sorry that's happened to you. You know, do you, do you know the number of someone you can speak to about that if you need therapy or whatever? That, that's often all it takes. And people mm -hmm. are so scared and of upsetting that they say nothing. And it's that saying nothing that's so isolating that people feel that, you know, I'm not, I can't mention it to anyone, they'll get embarrassed. So really mm. all that's required for, for the non-clinician, for the average person, if, if you become aware that someone's experienced trauma, it's simply acknowledging it, you know, validating the person and, and having, you know, the numbers to say the Blue Knot helpline or, or wherever mm. to point people in the right direction if they need more support. Yeah. Even, even to say, I don't know what to say, but I'm here. You mm. know? Yeah. Absolutely. What Absolutely. is it you feel you need? You know, how can I help? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So yep. hopefully that puts people's minds at rest a bit because it'd be really sad if on the one level, you know, public awareness is there, but another level don't quite know how to take it to the next step, which is feeling more comfortable to just yeah. respond in a humane way to something. Yeah. And knowing that there is help and support and that you can reach out for it. And uh, hmm. certainly all, all of the guidelines are on the Blue Knot website and, you know, can be downloaded for free or, or purchased uh, in hard copy. Yeah. Um, and just on that point about support, that's the, there's different types of support, aren't there? There's the clinical supporters for clinicians, absolutely. Yeah. But support for ourselves and each other as human beings is a different type of support, and that's no less important. Very well, important. that's right. And, uh, you know, it's a question of what's therapeutic, but we know there's thera therapeutic in the, in the broad sense, and therapeutic is, is being there in relationship with one another because uh, we know that, you know, complex trauma occurs in relationship and therefore can be healed in relationship.
Mm-hmm. Complex trauma predates the existence of clinicians, that's for sure. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So talking about complex trauma, you referred earlier to the 2019 uh, clinical practice guidelines and the update. Why do they need to be updated? Because 2012 is not that far uh, earlier than 2019. Yeah, well, that was actually my initial response when you asked me about it. I thought, do they really need? And then when I looked into it, and it just shows how fast the pace is and how we absorb change very quickly. A number of things have changed since 2012. One is that there is now a diagnosis, a formal diagnosis of complex PTSD. Now, diagnosis is not everything. Certainly you want to say that. And the complex PTSD diagnosis isn't, isn't even um, sufficient to address the many forms of complex trauma. Complex trauma is broader, but still to have that diagnosis of CPTSD, which came out as recently as 2018, and it's the release of the International Classification of Diseases, the 11th edition, the ICD-11, now has um, a freestanding complex PTSD diagnosis. And that's been hard fought for by over many years by Judith Herman, among others. So that, that's something significant in itself. It's not in the DSM, which is probably more used in Australia, but there's a dissociative subtype in the DSM. So really we're moving to increased recognition across the board that trauma is more complex than people realise. And the diagnosis itself testifies to that. Second thing, of course, since 2012 is the Royal Commission. Um, In fact, that was announced, I think I mentioned, but that that was really groundbreaking for that to coincide, Julia Gillard's announcement of that, almost directly with the release of the 2012 guidelines was game changing in itself in terms of raising the profile of complex trauma of Blue Knot as an organisation. Just to clarify which Royal Commission that was, because we've had a few now. Uh That was the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse. Yes, yeah. And that in itself makes the point, doesn't it? This this field is so alive with with commissions and inquiries, keeping track of them all. But that that was a major one, of course, for Blue Knot. The others too, very significant that we're experiencing now. So that was another one. Um, Another aspect, and this, this is the key thing, I guess maybe this is the main thing around the clinical update, is how dynamic the treatment landscape is. So many different approaches, modalities, suggestions, um, therapies are now available. And in combination with the internet, which is a genie out of the bottle, I mean, like it or not, people are, we are getting online. People are finding out things and looking at treatments and all sorts of things. So we really needed to expand um, and address the wide range of treatment options that are now available and try to try to assess them, to have a look at them. Some of them sort of not traditional in a, in a clinical psychotherapeutic sense, although the language is confusing because what's traditional in one field and what's alternative in one field is not in another. But we've got a whole um, chapter in the updated guidelines, which will probably be very interesting for people who don't always read, you know, the research. So I just want to go to the guidelines, but looking at Things like, you know, energy psychology, EMDR, which of course has been around for a long time, brain spotting, which is a newer sort of modality, hypnotherapy, clinical hypnotherapy, which is very recommended often for dissociation and is less well known for that reason, we need to raise awareness, and even MDMA assisted psychotherapy. So a number of new approaches. Mm. And of course, um, Stephen Porges polyvagal theory came out in 2011, just before the 2012 guidelines. But since 2012, there's a lot of polyvagal informed therapies now too. And some of those, um, you know, that does apply to some of these so-called newer approaches. So really important to address um, what's going on with treatment. Also phased treatment, which is recommended for complex trauma has, um, is being looked at again. There's a lot of different um, views about that. It's still recommended by complex trauma clinicians But in light of the changed treatment landscape, it's important to ask, can we safely accelerate treatment for complex trauma? There's so many different sort of, you know, body oriented type approaches, energy psychology, hypnotherapy that potentially can assist um, treatment of complex trauma, even in a phased way. So how we integrate some of these newer, newer approaches within phase treatment was another reason to update the guidelines. Um, And of course, a lot more on dissociation, and we'll get to that in a minute because we've got another set of guidelines on that. So do the 2019 guidelines um, replace the 2012 guidelines or how do do they sit together? So have some of the things presented in the 2012 guidelines been disproved 
Um, oh, that's a good. I was about to say they do replace, but they don't certainly don't disprove anything. Yeah, it's, I, I would. I think we'd probably recommend people go straight to the twenty nineteen guidelines now. Um, but just because they're so much more full and more up to date, so much really has happened, as we said in light of. And one happening we did I haven't mentioned yet is of course the Jenny Haynes verdict. You know, in twenty nine and just before we released the updated version, of course, there was a conviction of, of the father of Jenny Haynes um, who egregiously abused her daughter in her early childhood. So essentially we had a judicial validation of the DID diagnosis mm. and, and its etiology in, in childhood mm. trauma. So it, it's important to be aware that a lot has changed since 2012. And if you read the, the 2012 guidelines, you certainly won't be misled or, or get anything wrong. The information's there, but it's so much more detailed and up to date in the 2019 yeah, one. Yeah. And, and of course, there's a set of complementary guidelines that went alongside the 2019 guidelines. And you often say that you yes, know, yes. they've also <laughs> been pushed aside a little bit, but they're actually quite critical. So would you like to talk to them? Yeah, sure. I especially wanted to say something about that because complementary, they are complementary in the sense that they're shorter sets um, and they do sort of um, provide another aspect to the clinical ones, but they're not complementary, meaning that they're not significant or that they're optional. In fact, the complementary guidelines are two short sets within the same publication. And the first is on how does therapy for complex trauma differ from therapy for other, you know, other issues and other modalities. And this is really critical because most of us who work as clinicians know that we've had to substantially learn on the spot um, and tweak what we've learned. Now, it doesn't mean what we've learned in, in the range of different counselling courses and therapies that are out there hasn't been helpful, but it does need to be tweaked significantly. Um, things like, you know, and some standard articles of faith about what good therapy is actually need to be revised a little bit. Um, for example, we talk a lot about the whole person, uh, but as Janina Fisher says, for someone who's severely dissociated, um, and fragmented if they don't perceive themselves as a whole person it's hard, and it's hard for the therapist to perceive as a whole person and we are really you know talking about parts a lot of therapies talk about using I statements and I know that was what I'd learned as a as a student of counseling very quickly encouraging people to you know own their experience and use I the I pronoun but for someone who's fragmented and dissociated that's very difficult to do so using I statements would come well down the track um, and also relates to resourcing. Often many approaches assume a person can ground pretty quickly. They might say, think of a nice experience you've had. But it's really important for every clinician to know that people with complex trauma do start in a very different place than people who don't. So a lot of the standard things we might suggest and assume need to be substantially tailored. So that's what the first set of guidelines in the complementary yeah. sense. And can I ask what's the risk of... Um not knowing that, not knowing, you know, the, the, those different um, differences that you've just stressed? I think the risk is, is very, very high. I mean, I, I guess at best it would mean um, inefficient therapy that goes around the mulberry bush for a very long time before there's a clear sense of what's going on for mm -hmm. both client and therapist often. And at worst it would mean active re-traumatisation where a person isn't connecting at all with, with the approach that's being um, assumed. So it really is very important. We know with, for a diagnosis of DID, it can take years for that to be accurately um, diagnosed. But there's also, as we'll talk about, a range of, of um, disorders, quote unquote, and even um, experiences and conditions that fall short of a clinical diagnosis, but that do relate to dissociation. Um, and, you know, so it's very important that every clinician knows something about this and how not to just assume that the frameworks they've learned in their college or their university, um, as general and as benign as they seem to be, can just, just be, yeah. you know, transposed into work with conflict. So not necessarily benign at all? No, not necessarily. I mean, a good example is... Um, and a very salutary example for a lot of us is that empathy is certainly not enough. And, and Peter Levine's talked about this. And most of us in, as clinicians like to feel we're empathetic people and genuinely do empathise with clients. But for a client who's never received empathy and warmth and is understandably very distrustful of, of human contact, because therapy is profoundly triggering, of course, um, it can be very shaming for a client to feel that they can't respond to the empathy of the therapist. So there's actually a number, this is, these are really important, got a number of things where we think we're on the right track and we could actually be um, yeah. actually distressing the client without realising.
So we really should be talking about these guidelines a lot more. A lot more, absolutely. Yeah. And the second set in the complementary is the competencies for therapists. So it follows well, they're two short sets. You know, this is how therapy differs for complex trauma. And these are the competencies ideally you, you should have. So really they're quite foundational. Yeah. <laughs> Even prior to the clinical yeah. guidelines, the complementary ones, um, yeah. you know, should be really yeah. looked at by everybody unless they already know quite a lot about yeah. complex trauma yeah. stuff. And they're certainly very accessible as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned dissociation, and uh, you know that brings us to to a, an additional set of guidelines, um, <laughs> which yeah. obviously, yeah, there's there's been a lot of research which you know is not not necessarily all that well understood around dissociation and different models. And... No, it's it's still not, and this is another one that's um, sort of quite challenging because again, the awareness about the prevalence of trauma and the fight, flight, freeze response. Everybody can sort of say that trifecta: fight, flight, freeze. But actually, most of us, including clinicians, know much less about the third of those responses. Fight and flight are pretty obvious, you know, fighting back and fleeing. And, um, but freezing, which is linked to the hypo shutdown response, actually, um, dissociation is incredibly complex. It's not only shut down. A person may be active in their behaviour, but still be dissociated. Um, but in contrast to hyperarousal, which is visible, we can usually see if someone's distressed. With dissociation, it's much less apparent um, and it can easily pass, you know, we, people just pass the awareness of a clinician. So it's really important that we all need to tune into the possibility of it, how to recognise the signs of it. Um, and some of the work on which we draw in the new dissociation guidelines makes the point, this, was, this came out in 2017, this book, but not much has changed in some ways, that most clinicians don't know how to recognise dissociation. They haven't been trained to, they don't know how to assess for it. So that's why we have this second set, as we're saying. Um, so we've got a chapter on dissociation in the clinical updated, which is a basic, why is dissociation important? That's important to read. But is so much around dissociation it's important now that we've released a second set specifically dedicated to dissociation in its various forms how to recognize it how to work with it and so on and what's the best way to understand dissociation because it's not always related to trauma is it yeah no that not at all um so i think myself the continuum model is very helpful there, there are people who disagree with it and, and i we can understand that there's always different views on everything but if we see um you know, a continual model, which we use for many forms of psychological um, issues and disorders, are relatively mild at one end and more severe at the other end, we can start to see how dissociation can take many forms. And in fact, dissociation is simply at a basic level, just not being present, just tuning out. And when we look at it like that, we can see how it can be very benign and normal and everyday, because we all do that for all sorts of reasons all the time. And there's nothing wrong with that. However, if we have to use that response um, regularly to protect ourselves, as in the case of childhood trauma, if that, the need to dissociate and shut down and not notice is, is frequent and has to be um, activated all the time, it becomes primarily protective and defensive and it can become the way the mind organises. So people automatically um, dissociate in a, in a more severe way that impedes quality of life. So we could have at one level mild dissociation like daydreaming, highway hypnosis, all sorts of minor forms at one end of the continuum, right the way up to, to DID at the other. So that's probably a helpful way to explain it. But it also shows how complex it is. So that's why we wanted a separate publication to sort of address some of that. Well, why do you think um, the sector has struggled so much around dissociation, around accepting it? Um, because, you know, certainly the research shows, you know, yeah, how fundamental it really is um, mm. to us mm. as human beings. Um, and yet the, the, there's, there's still quite a split in the psychological counselling community around it. Yes, yeah. Um, I think there's a number of reasons for that. I, I, and one of them, I think, is that in, in our sort of, Western culture in a way, we, we be reluctant to sort of draw attention to something when we're not sure. I mean, often when we speak to someone, when we tune in, we really do realise that somebody's hesitated for quite a long time or looked away where we didn't expect them to. And we've kind of dismissed it as, oh, that's just normal. And it could be just normal. Yeah. But I think our, our desire to sort of not address something until we're absolutely sure has meant that we've 
you know, in clinicians as well have let a lot go. So there's that. We're not used to sort of raising something. And that's another issue with where therapy is different. I, I learned as a, as, as a student, you know, the client always leads. The therapist shouldn't be proactive. It'll come from the client. Of course, with dissociation, if the person doesn't know they're dissociating, or even if they know but they're embarrassed about it, which is very common too, they're not going to mention it. So it goes back to the previous question. When we're sitting there thinking we're connecting well with the client and this important aspect isn't even noted at all. So that, that's one. A second one, though, um, and perhaps more um, um, significant, is we are very reluctant as, as a human species, I think, and understandably, to countenance really egregious violations of other people, especially when they relate to children. And now DID is the most severe form. There's many forms of dissociation, including severe, that, that don't take the form of DID. But certainly if somebody has to defend by dissociating protectively frequently, it's usually for a very good reason and a very disturbing reason. And there's such a thing as, as cultural dissociation too. We see it in denial of war, not wanting to face up to um, recompensing where there's been injustice. So I think there's a very human... Um, desire not to want to make those connections to kind of pretend they're not there even when they are so there's that aspect as well and so what's hope and help is there for people experiencing trauma related dissociation and you know um and who who uh, do live with did um, yeah there's so much more now and that's why we wanted to release um the guidelines uh, it seemed to be initially something, oh, maybe it's important, but what do we do about it? But there is so much we can do and so much we need to know. And an example of that would be mindfulness. Now, mindfulness has become such a common approach and it's a good approach. Mindfulness is important, but it, it's not um, something people who are dissociated can, can readily do. Um, one of the clinicians we draw on, Christine Fauna, who's written a, a book on um, mindfulness with dissociation. So that's important for people to know about um, this could be where people are unwittingly traumatised by clinicians who are encouraging the client to be mindful, but mindfulness is in opposition to dissociation because mindfulness is about focused attention, yeah. dissociation is about losing attention, not being able to pay attention. So you've got a, contra a contradiction between the two and the dissociation will always win with trauma. People can't concentrate if they're distressed. So even just knowing that, that um, you know, some of the approaches that are there have to be worked up to they can't be assumed. There's different ways we can help people to notice. Mm. Uh, needs to be taken slowly. They need to be resourced. Mm. There's a lot of different ideas and suggestions for working with dissociation that we've tried to include in the guidelines mm. um, and just break down that, that silence and not knowing that's existed for, for too long and still does exist, really. The Blue Knot Day 2020 is about hope and possibilities for healing. So... Mm. You know, mm. the, the, there are real possibilities for healing for people with, with dissociation. Absolutely. And Marlene Steinberg's a clinician who, who said that the fact that even severe, you know, dissociation and fragmentation of the personality can be recovered from is a sign of hope and healing for all of us. She says yeah. that. So that, that's the other good thing. We know so much more from the neuroscience, from mm. clinical reports and so on, that far yeah. more recovery is possible than was yeah. thought back in, um, you know, the late... Yeah, very, very critical for us for people listening to know that. Mm, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So as we talk, we seem to have a lot of guidelines, a lot of publications, but I just want to quickly flag um, the ones for supervisors of uh, complex trauma therapists. Ah, uh, yes, yeah. This, yeah, this, and there's one other one to mention too before we sign off. Yeah, the supervisors is, is a very important one because many people who are supervisors, of course, are already well qualified and already experienced, and they may have seen a lot of um, therapists and supervisors them who've dealt with trauma, but they may not themselves be up with the latest on trauma research because a lot of it has come out, let's face it, in the last 10 to 15 years, you know, validating the more recent stuff. So it's really important that supervisors don't think, oh, I already know this um, just because I've been in the field for a long time. Yes, you're very qualified in your field, but really, if you haven't um, looked at some of the more recent stuff, you may be surprised, as we said, in light of you know, not assuming that certain approaches will work very well um, by how much the fields change. So there's a separate set of guidelines for supervisors um, that will really help both with their own knowledge and working with the clinicians they supervise. 
Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think we have one more that we are uh, flagging, which is upcoming. Have we uh, covered all the others that we've already published? It's uh... Oh, well, the, the, I just wanted to mention briefly, they're not guidelines as such, but a very important um, and accessible paper also online at the Blue Knight website is the um, paper on memory. Yeah. That's because, again, this is just how much has changed, how much has moved with the research. There's so much on memory now that we really, we've obviously put some of that into the clinical update. But yeah. that too merited more detailed discussion than yeah. could be accommodated easily. So we've got a paper called um, The Truth of Memory and the Memory of Truth, yeah. different types of memory and the significance for trauma. This is so important because a lot of people in the psi professions, and this is a point that Peter Levine makes very credentialed in, in his field, Many people in the side profession still don't really um, understand the distinctions between um, explicit and implicit memory. In other words, conscious and, and non-conscious. We know, you know, there's such a thing as an un unconscious. Most people recognise that. But when we talk about memory, we tend to assume it's the autobiographical, narrative, verbal, conscious form of memory rather than the subcortical forms, which is what traumatic memory relates to. So it's not all that complicated, I mean, it can be complicated, but we've broken it down into the key points about the differences between explicit and implicit memory and the significance for trauma. And that's in that separate paper on the truth of memory that people can download from the website as well. Of course, that's, uh, you know, obviously critical for people with lived experience, but also for health professionals and the legal and justice system as well. Mm, uh, issues memory are obviously uh, 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 prominent. Yeah, absolutely. And also, too, the trauma informed that we're about to get to for the legals as well. I yeah. mean, often if somebody appears to be a bit disorganised in their presentation, obviously it's quite challenging to present in a court anyway, mm. people can look unreliable, they can look as if they're not, you know, together and so on because they're not presenting coherently. So important that legal people understand as they're starting to and blue knots done some work with legals yeah, the yeah. impacts of trauma on the brain and body and how somebody may appear to be yeah. um you know very disorganized in their presentation but it is not at all necessarily a sign that they of their veracity or um exactly and of course we, did, we did publish a, a small paper for the legal and justice sector as well mm -hmm. around some trauma-informed uh, legal processes yeah um, so the up the upcoming publication. <laughs> no one. Well, I mean, I'm, I Is think, everybody still with us? <laughs> yes, I think it's fantastic to reflect, and uh, but as we uh, talk about all the different publications, they really are very significant. So uh, mm -hmm. I just want to thank you for your incredible research and contribution to not just Blue Knot and Survivors, but to the field overall. Well, it's been very gratifying to know that we're living at a time where we can make this information accessible to people that's the exciting thing isn't it so yeah. and I guess we say to people if, if you're not getting a sense of hope to hope and optimism in the treatment you're receiving you really really should be that you know that's validated by the research that so much is possible yeah. in terms of exactly recovery. exactly yeah. but yeah the, the final set upcoming is as we said before releasing as a separate set the organizational trauma informed guidelines so we're separating out the clinical, which are the updated 2019. These are the non-clinical, um, organisational, how services, mental health, health, and more broadly in society um, can and should organise to treat people in a humane way. So trauma-informed basically um, says that we know trauma is so prevalent, even if we don't know whether the people we come in contact with have it and the chances are they could have and they may not say it they may not know it so therefore our organizations need to be set up in such a way to be reassuring to assist with with trust and, and so on so trauma-informed organizations is about yes yeah, setting up organizations that treat people humanely know about the impacts of trauma on the brain and body, just know how not to make things worse, really. It's as simple as that. But that is top to bottom. It's every aspect of the organisation from policies and procedures to, you know, even to volunteers, people in casual positions, anybody who's in contact with anybody, which, of course, they are in various capacities, needs to know 
how to relate to and carry out their position in a way that doesn't make things worse for people. Yeah, and, need to be trauma informed. Yeah, and, and similarly to the to the clinical space, there's been um, a lot of progress since 2012, since the original trauma informed guidelines. And uh, I know these guidelines will include some. Um, cases where implementation has proceeded and uh, just looks at the outcomes of, of that. Mm, yeah, and there was a, a book that came out at the end of 2019, I think, wasn't it, called Humanising Mental Health Care in Australia. So psychiatrist Richard Benjamin in Tasmania and Joan Halliburn, a psychiatrist in Sydney, and um, Serena King, a psychologist, have co-edited the first mm -hmm. trauma-informed textbook that we draw on in, in our yeah. upcoming guidelines. And it just charts some of how far we've come since yeah. you know in the last decade in, in organizations yeah. moving towards becoming trauma informed in australia yeah. yeah and you and i were both um honored to to write chapters you know for that particular mm. organization so. yeah 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 so it's great and again that shows why we needed to do this update because all, all this has happened since 2012 yeah in one of my favorite survivor memoirs Susanna Kaysen wrote that suicide is more complicated than wanting to die. It's about wanting to exile a part or parts of yourself. The parts of yourself that hold terrifying sensory fragments from the past and are stuck, unable to metabolize the fear, despair and rage they bear. The parts of you that carry shame. The parts of you exhausted from years of carrying that shame, intense muscle and locked jaw. The parts of you convinced that no one is ever coming to the rescue to help you hold space for your pain and let you know you're okay. My name is Scarlett and I'm a 27 year old dissociative survivor of complex trauma coming to you from unceded Darragland. This year I celebrated four years without a suicide attempt and this 10 year personal best could not have been possible without the relationships that have supported me to embrace these young, traumatized, shame-ridden parts of myself. Parts I tried for decades to exile to unconsciousness with starvation, self-harm or suicide. We all have different parts of ourselves, but complex trauma meant that mine never had the opportunity to integrate, fragmenting my consciousness and memory so a part of me could carry on with daily life and coexist with my abusers. This sophisticated defense mechanism is known as structural dissociation. Living with a dissociative disorder is like trying to drive a bus with 30 different passengers, all trying to be backseat drivers, all insisting the bus should go in different directions. Some breathe down your neck, berating you, for every navigational decision. Some are small children and sob in the corner with their backs to the others, forcing you to take your eyes from the road. Some try to smash the windows of the bus in a bid to escape it entirely. And occasionally, some hijack the bus and push you out of the driver's seat. Many survivors like me are left feeling confused and alone the fact is, dissociative disorders and complex trauma more generally are largely overlooked in mainstream Australian mental health and social services. When even the professionals and the experts don't understand what's going on, how can we even begin to make sense of ourselves? How can we feel anything but shame when saddled with explanations for our distress that locate the problem within us rather than around us? in experiences of abuse, neglect, violence, and intergenerational oppression. This shame and blame is a huge problem, and it shouldn't be, because the reality is we are far from alone. One in four Australian adults live with a legacy of complex trauma, and recent Australian research found that dissociative disorders are nearly as common as depression. So what possibilities for healing exist for dissociative survivors? The key is that complex trauma is relational and is healed in relationship. Attuned relationships, whether with friends and fellow survivors or with therapeutic professionals, 
allow me to greet all parts of myself gently and with curiosity so that I can find out what their needs are and learn to soothe them. It is through attuned relationships that I have been able to experiment with new ways of relating to myself and my bus passengers as the safe, reliable person I needed when I was growing up with abuse and neglect. Recovery is not a destination to return to after going mad. In my case, where abuse and violence began in infancy, there is no meaningful destination to return to. For me, recovery and healing are about learning to return to my body after having to vacate it for years to survive. Recovery is about learning to be soothed by others so I don't have to try and exile the parts of me in need of soothing so they don't need to intrude upon me so dramatically and destructively. Of course, there is a basic level of safety and stability that is required before this phase of healing is possible. Complex trauma set me up for decades of re-traumatization in the justice, psychiatric, child protection, public housing and welfare systems. It wasn't until I finally received the disability pension after two years of applying, till I finally received victim's compensation nearly six years after my rape, till I finally made it to the top of the list for public outpatient support after my seventh suicide attempt and upteenth involuntary hospitalization, that I finally had some reprieve from crisis mode. And this is where I wanna be careful when I talk about recovery and healing. It's easy to inspire you with a then and now comparison. Back then, I flunked out of uni twice. I was in and out of the emergency department every month. Despair and loneliness were my constant companions. Now I'm on the Dean's list for academic excellence. I'm healthier than I've ever been and despair and loneliness are infrequent visitors and taste more like tenderness than terror. It is both true that I have worked very hard to make these things happen, to secure financial and housing stability and access to therapy. And it is true that whiteness and social capital have given me a decent head start on some survivors. If we're not careful, recovery narratives risk elevating good survivors who appear to work hard to heal above bad survivors who appear to be stuck in a rut for decades facing ongoing victimization. These narratives erase the power asymmetries among survivors that expand or limit their access to healing tools. We tend to think of recovery as the individual pursuit of linear progress, but my story, like so many others, illustrates that individualism is a myth. It takes a village to parent a child, and it can take a village to reparent a survivor of complex trauma. The complex trauma I've experienced since childhood has defined my life. To insist otherwise would be to deny the gravity of what I've been through, it does nothing to facilitate healing and insults other survivors. Only by recognizing and learning about the way trauma has shaped my nervous system, my sense of self, and my patterns of relating to others, have I been able to begin to rewire my brain and reparent myself. Everyone's nervous system, sense of self, and patterns of relating are shaped by their childhoods and their relationships, but we only hear about it when it goes wrong. And even then, not enough people are making this connection. I cannot overstate the value that learning about complex trauma has had for me as a survivor. Where the dominant story of mental suffering shames and pathologizes, the story of complex trauma highlights how my emotional distress and altered states are not about what is wrong with me, but about what has happened to me and the very sophisticated ways that my body and mind have learned to adapt and survive. But it is not simply a matter of self-compassion for survivors, although the stories we tell have an enormous impact on survivors' sense of shame 
It is a matter of telling stories that cultivate better institutional, cultural and legislative responses to complex trauma. I believe healing is possible for everyone, but only if people have the opportunity to heal, only with safety from violence, affordable access to long-term trauma-informed therapy, and freedom from the kind of violence, the kind of slow violence enacted by bureaucracies that are designed to help people, but which often do the opposite. To secure these basic things for people, it matters what stories we tell. It matters when a young woman is told her personality is disordered and not told that betrayal and violation in her early life explain her suffering. It matters when a man is shamed for drug addiction and not told that far from being a character flaw, it makes perfect sense that he would want to exile to unconsciousness certain memories and feelings given the sexual abuse he grew up with. It feels important for me to share that not all of my bus passengers are happy that I'm here today. Do not appreciate being visible because visibility has been dangerous for us. It's a constant struggle for me to hold their fears alongside that which I know to be true. That seeing, being seen and being held in mind by another person and learning to become comfortable with that kind of intimacy is the ultimate antidote to shame. For me, nothing has done more to dispel the shame at the core of trauma than the company and friendship of other people coming to terms with their pain and being supported to heal. I've been very fortunate to meet some of my closest friends through art therapy, through complex trauma psychoeducation groups, through peer support for suicide attempt survivors, through yoga, my therapists over the years have provided the safe container that I need to sit with the paradox of longing to be seen while desperately fearing being visible to another. This is why it matters what stories we tell, why it matters how we talk about people who suffer chronic homelessness or self-harm or eating disorders, because it takes a whole of society approach to set up opportunities for safety and healing. Relationship is where we find the possibility of healing. Thanks. I think what's happened today with the launch of the Blue Knot Foundation's new guidelines um, is an incredible achievement and it is a necessary thing to happen. And what it does is bringing a lot more respect and compassion for victims and understanding and they're validated in these guidelines because when I was first diagnosed, I was diagnosed with um, a different diagnosis to what I actually have. And that caused a lot of detriment to them working and, and bringing, raising children, but with greatest understanding now of dissociation and um, dissociative disorders and understanding of complex trauma, complex post-traumatic stress disorder, people are starting to realize now that there has been a lot of people that have been harmed and <laughs> now with these new guidelines it shows that there's an understanding of people that have been hurt, survivors and victims that now can get help and be appreciated and understood and this is a huge day today to have that happen. I was abused in an institution and one of the first things I did when I got out of that institution was to seek the help of a psychiatrist who diagnosed me incorrectly and I didn't go back. So I went back into living a life where I was hardly functioning um, and doing my very, very best to be a mum and, and to, you know, be functional. And I felt that, you know, I still wasn't having my needs met. And um, and it was, only, it was only through just recently the Royal Commission being able to tell my story and being able to seek help and get um, understood because there's still a lot of people today um, that don't understand complex trauma and the effects of it and the guidelines today will help psychiatrists and psychologists and counsellors and mental health professionals understand that complex trauma has huge effects on a person and affects that person's functioning and, and their, their mind body and soul really and not just us but it for our children and, and things like you know 
our friends that, that can understand us and give us the support we need and give us the validation and, and help in life that we can flourish. <laughs> I think with complex trauma, when other trauma comes along or day-to-day -day life, you know, like um, it compounds who we are and, and what the effects of that are on us. And um, I think if I had been diagnosed correctly in the beginning, and if, we, if there was a bigger understanding of, of complex trauma and association and post-traumatic stress and things like that, I think I would have been able to, you know, be more um, functional in society, being able to, you know, secure work and to have my children um, feel more secure and, and understanding as well. And I think it's a flow-on effect. I think that is... Um, you know, with relationships of any kind, I think there needs to be understanding, and um, and I think that's really would have been changed if it had been, uh, you know, acknowledged years ago. That would have been a different life for for myself, and um, and I think you know I probably would have been, you know, more educated, more self secure, and yeah, and it stops a lot of people from moving forward with their lives because it's not that understanding. I think. What Julia Gillard did by having a Royal Commission made a huge difference to a lot of people. And I think talking to a commissioner and telling them my story and having him actually know people from my past that um, had shared similar um, life stories and not be around today to be able to tell their stories um, said a lot. And for me, it meant a lot because it meant that I was validated and that I could seek help and that that help was there for me to, to get. And that, um, yeah, and then, you know, even the commissioner would say, you know, the big difference in me from when he first saw me to when he sees me now is huge. And, you know, the confidence and, and that, you know, I'm able to speak to people that, you know, are just wonderful and, <laughs> and supportive. I think there's meaningful, I think there's been meaningful change since the Royal Commission. I think there's still people that don't believe in complex trauma or don't believe in dissociative disorders. I think there's people that can't still face that, that society has let people down. Um, but I, I do think the majority of people are coming to terms with how things are coming, you know, forward, how people are coming forward and saying, hey, we're real, uh, they'll get validation and people are relieved. I mean, no one would do this for fun. <laughs> um, you know, no, you don't make up this stuff. <laughs> You would, why would you do that? <laughs> so, you know, it, it helps you feel that you've finally got a voice and that you can speak out. And people have experienced mental health issues for a long, long time, you know, since the beginning of time. And now I think there's hope that people can get well and they can get, you know, into society and, and for, form a part of that helping part of society that is necessary for, for people to be involved in. I think there needs to be a lot more done. Like I think there's big leaps and bounds, um, like really not launching this um, guidelines is a huge thing. And I think there is help and support out there. Um, it's just accessing that and it needs to be more recognised and more available and yeah, always can improve and always can get better.